Whenever you enter a city and the people don't welcome you, go out into the streets and say, as a complaint against you, we brush off the dust of your city that is collected on our feet. But know this, God's kingdom has come to you. So the 72 went out. And then a few verses later, it says, The 72 returned joyously, saying, Lord, even the demons submit themselves to us in your name. And Jesus replied, I saw Satan fall like, uh, fall from him like lightning. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Um, have you ever had a really bad day? I, I know that most of you have not. But there's a couple of people who have surely who've had a bad day. Uh, I remember once a, a day, one of my bad days, one, one of uh, many, but one of those bad days uh, was a day when I was working at the church and I woke up, you know, just kind of woke up with a bad headache and, and breakfast didn't go well and then my first, my morning meetings didn't go well. Nothing was happening well that day. And I went in and there was a person in the church when I walked in the door to go to my office who was just doing a lot of stuff, cleaning tables and getting rid of clutter and stuff like that. And she said, you know, how are you today? And I said, you know, just, just I decided to take a step forward in vulnerability, you know. I said, uh, my, I'm doing really bad. My, my day has been awful. And so she picked up a sticker off the table and it said, smile, God loves you. And she said, well, here's a sticker. Smile, God loves you. And walked away. <laughs> God loves you or, or smile, God loves you or be happy, God loves you. That message is just of ubiquitous. It's everywhere. You find it on stickers. You find it on magnets. Uh, you find it draped across the front of football, you know, uh, stadium uh, bleachers. God loves you. God loves you. In fact, it's so uh, ubiquitous, maybe it becomes like noise in the background. It's just something that we say or sing about or pray about. Maybe even something we say when we don't know what else to say. Well, God loves you. So, in the Hellenistic world, and in the world that John wrote in, that My Michael read from John, uh, that was not a common thing at all. In fact, the idea that God was love or was loving would have been foolishness or, or folly. So in the Hellenistic world, and if you can remember some of your middle school myths and, and Greek mythology, the gods were capricious. You never knew what they were going to do. They were vengeful. They would gladly get back at people and punish them. They were competitive with each other. So that was part of what you saw happening in nature where the gods were fighting. Uh, they, were, they were unpredictable. But they were not loving. There was no God in the pantheon that was loving. In fact, in the Hellenistic society there, the idea of being loving towards uh, people who were in need, uh, loving towards those who were sick or, or incapable of helping themselves for some reason, or those, those whom were really down on their luck, the idea of being compassionate toward them was, um, it was not really in the water. It was not a commonplace idea. In fact, it was kind of a, more of a stoic society. So the idea was... Uh, you know, you help yourself, and the, the strongest survive, and the notion of helping somebody who was in need was sort of perpetuating weakness in the society. 
Why would you help someone who is in need? Because obviously they are one of the weaker members of society. And if you help them, you just perpetuate their immoral behavior or, or their weak genes or whatever it was that got them into that situation. It's a very hard-nosed kind of society. The gods were hard-nosed, and as a, as a society, they were hard-nosed. And so John's writing into that context and says God is love. God is love. And that landed a lot more radically than we hear it land. John wrote God is love because of Jesus. Not because God wrote a book about love or wrote it in the sky or handed on a philosophy about love. John wrote God is love because of Jesus. So John 3.16, that is probably draped as I speak over an NFL bleacher. Uh, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. So it's that incarnational act of, of giving is how God shows God's love. Of stepping into the situation and being present. It's not that God wrote to us about it. But God did it. God stepped out. And so into this world where no one imagined that God was loving, comes Jesus who is the embodiment of self-sacrificial love. Of giving himself in love for others. And John says, that's God. And from the very beginning, Christians said, if that's how God is, and our commandment is to be that way. So it's interesting if you read early church history, and I'm not going to go into it now, but you read early church history and see how the church was loving uh, people in society, both one another and then eventually those who were not part of the Christian community. It was one of the most radical parts of their life together, was their love for each other. And then their love for others. So in 251, there's this plague that ended up being called Cyprian's Plague. And uh, the plague was, was killing many people. And the official Roman government said, there's nothing we can do. The gods are mad. And so we just have to placate the gods. And, and people were just dying in the street. And the dead in the street were being left in the street because nobody wanted to touch them. And, and people weren't really helping the sick. If you were sick and you didn't have family, there was nothing to be done. It was the Christians who stepped into that gap. They stepped into the gap and they they buried the dead and they cared for the sick. And they did that because God is love. And they decided to take that love of God and share it with other people. So, at the time, people didn't think God was love. That was a, a strange concept. And maybe it's more familiar today, but the thing I was thinking about um, as I was thinking about the service is maybe it's not as familiar as we think it is. I wonder if the idea that God is love is hard to believe for anybody. I was thinking about some of the places where we were serving today. If you can't put food on the table for your kids, And someone comes and slaps a sticker on there and says, smile, God loves you. How believable is that? If you're trying to make ends meet and and you can't find a car to get yourself to work and the public transportation won't do it, and it seems like people just won't help you. You know, they they say God loves you and I'll pray for you, but, but I really need a car. Is it very believable to think that God loves you? If you're living on the street and you don't have any place to come in out of the rain and the wind, and someone kind of comes by with a sticker and says, God loves you. How believable is that? See, I bet in our world with natural disasters and infant mortality and, and diseases that claim the lives of young and old and wars and homelessness and job loss and foreclosure, you kind of go down the list. I bet for many people it's hard to believe that God is love. I bet their idea of God is a lot more like that idea of a Greek God that's probably vengeful maybe punishing them is, at the very least, checked out of their life and circumstance. 
So, if people are going to believe that God is love, if that's going to have any credibility at all, it comes along with people who are willing to step, just like Jesus, into the gap, into the void, and say, here, I will embody God's love in presence, not just in words. In being there and showing up. You know, that's like 99% of it, right? Just showing up. To say, I'll, I'll do that because that's how God loves, that's how I'll love. I'll step into that void. And then that person maybe has a chance that underneath the pain and suffering that they experience, underneath that, there is a divine love. There is a divine love that orders and creates and blesses the universe and their lives. But that's not believable with just a sticker or with just words. It's believable with hands and feet and presence. So that's part of why I was excited about us doing what we did today. Because it's a way for us to embody the love of Christ and then for it to be embodied back to us. In that story from Luke, it's really interesting how Jesus sends out the disciples. Um, Jesus was not a volunteer coordinator. And you get that from this story. Jesus would have like, stood on a chair and said, Hey, I need 70 people and I'm going to send you out with no instructions and it's probably going to be dangerous and I can't promise what's going to happen. It's not how you recruit volunteers. That's what Jesus did. He appointed them and sent them out and he said, when you get there, I don't want you to take anything with you. So I want you to be dependent on the hospitality of the people you're with. So Jesus sent out the 72 in mission to bless others, but by sending them out without any supplies, he made them dependent on the people they were with, and so they were also the recipients of blessing. It's a two-way street. And I bet today we experience that two-way street as we went out to be present, to worship with, to serve, to feed, to uh, we washed cars in the snow, that was what we did today, um, to, to serve and love others, we felt that serving and loving coming back to us as a, as a relationship. That's what God intends it to be. Um, so this is your chance. I, I want to hear from you. As I said at be the beginning, um, where love is, God is there. So I believe you encountered God today in some way. It could have been through an insight or an inspiration, through a realization, through a person, uh, someone that, that touched you. I think you met God somewhere in your day, and I wonder if you'd like to share that insight or moment or, or fulfillment. Just stand up. If you talk quiet, we've got a mic. Um, but this is your chance. This is your chance to share that. Just overflowing. And we receive. I could follow up on what 
So about 17 of us went to the AHOPE Day Center this morning. Um, we were youth and adults, and our task was to uh, deep clean the area. It gets cleaned uh, on a daily basis by the staff there, but they have a very short time with which to do that on a daily basis because their funding is limited. Uh, and some folks also were painting some offices. So some of the middle school youth actually jumped at the chance to clean one of the bathrooms. And after they were in there for a few minutes, they came out and said, we can't scrub this graffiti off, and some of it's really bad. And uh, John Meadows suggested, well, why don't we cover it up with something else? And so the middle school youth uh, took some Sharpie markers, and that which they could not scrub off completely, where, where some nasty, hateful things were still showing through, they covered it up with words of kindness. Hmm. They covered it up with uh, quotes, with pictures, um, with, with things that people might actually want to read if they're having a rough day. And to me, giving that to folks who, who might not see a lot of positivity in their day, um, offering one more positive thing for them to see may color the way that they see the rest of the day. Um, and I thought that was a really amazing gift that those young women were able to give today. Thanks. Her bearing was regal. Picture her standing there with longer earrings and dressed like you might expect an African queen. In fact, her name is Queen. She, she, yeah, you, you know her? Okay, I had not experienced her before. Today, she participated quite well in the service at Beloved along with the pastor, Amy, talking about the ancestors. And she taught us a new word. And she spoke of when we die. And the, the scripture was um, with basically, you have to die to become life again. Um, part of the sermon was about a seed being buried and coming back to life. But Queen said, that when our ancestors 
are dying and going back to the Creator, that the Creator comes and is all, God is always with us. And so because God is always with us, our ancestors are always with us. And it's a very interesting concept for me to think about that, something I learned new today. And she says that when you speak to your ancestors, you should tap your feet. And it reminds me of what we heard today about if you're unwelcome in the town, maybe shake that dust off of your feet. But if you're welcome, that dust will remain on your feet and you're with your ancestors. And each time they would speak of these folks, they would say this word, a shah. Was it, is that how it was said? Sandra, help me. Sandra Strickland, you're here, right? What, how do they say it? Ashe. Ashe, okay, Ashe. It was Ashe. Um, I was about to ask, what is this Ashe? And Michael says, what is this Ashe? <laughs> <laughs> And, and um, it's rather like a man. It's so be it. And it was quite a fascinating piece of that. What brought it home was the way that these folks had remembered, they had a memory wall of photographs of people who had died on the streets or had been their friends and one had been hit by a car as she was riding her bicycle to some place where someone had offered her rest for the night. And the, the community that the folks have was very enlightening to me. So I say about what we have done today as our gift of love to our neighbors and what we have received as well, Ashe. Ashe, cool. cool. Uh, Howard and, and Sandra. We just came from Deerfield, where we visited another queen, Queen Susan, uh, and we, by chance, uh, experienced both sadness and peace. Uh, it happened to be that we were there at the moment that the hospice person was coming in to take a, uh, care of signing up the needs for. Susan Hudson Seaton. Her two daughters were there, one from the northwest, north of uh, <coughs> Seattle, one from the northeast, uh, north of Boston, and her son from Tallahassee. So it was as though we had, you know, the national embrace of love and care. And, you know, they told us by chance and that uh, we happened to be there at the moment of her uh, most awareness during the day. Hmm. So we come with uh, appreciation of the family for all the welcome, support, the care that uh, Susan and her uh, former husband, Hudson, uh, have received from this church, but also uh, with the prospect that uh, they know that they were just, you know, delighted that we happened to be there at the moment, uh, that we were uh, uniting forces in a different way than we ever expected. And of course, we told them, this is Love Asheville Day. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Thanks, Howard. I don't need it. Oh, okay. you, you got it. You got to teach. <laughs> but I was, um, I was cleaning a refrigerator and trying to reach up to the very back corner of that refrigerator and clean it, knowing that no one was ever going to see that, but every bit much love went into cleaning that thing that no one would ever see, and it was just a reminder that every day we all do things that people are not aware of and do, and they're done every bit as much love and taking that out. So thank you for that Cairo group. It was a great day. Today I also went to Beloved House and 
it's I've been around in homeless and homeless programs with Room in the End and Saturday Sanctuary, which are wonderful. But at times you get a little stressed, a little tense. Today at Belovedness, before I went, Michael said, "Okay, it's going to be chaos. It's really chaotic." It was, but it was peaceful. I did not feel any stress or tension. People knew what they were doing. They felt loved. I felt loved. It was just the most peaceful chaos that I've ever seen. It was just a great <laughs> program. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Beverly, you, you and then pass the mic down. Need... Okay, then I'll okay. pass, <laughs> try it and then pass it So, down. I probably don't, I just want to say that this morning in the First Presbyterian Church kitchen, we had a great time, so it was fun being with my uh, fellow church members, and that was, um, uh, that was a blessing to me. And uh, it was also a blessing that my son uh, was with me, uh, willingly and excitedly doing his, his volunteering, and that, that's brilliant and wonderful. But the most important thing that happened, I just realized when I was driving over here, was because I kept my t-shirt on all day. And so I actually got to tell five people who I know for a fact, not that it necessarily matters, but I know for a fact do not in attend any church and out of those five people all five of them listened very intently as I told them what I did this morning instead of sit and listen to a sermon no offense <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and each and for all those people I made sure I went like this and look and I you know I showed my <laughs> teacher but what I want to say is all five of those people listened very intently I could tell they were all surprised in fact two of them went like this <laughs> really? And I said, yeah, that's what we did this morning. And then we're just going to meet up later at 4.30 and just, you know, we'll probably just sort of talk about it and be happy about it, which is in, uh, predicted right. <laughs> so I think that maybe the best thing is the love hmm. that might happen because we all walked around with our t-shirts. I think that's going to be an important message, you know? <laughs> that we were willing to unbutton our collars, I guess, is... I think it surprised people that we were willing to unbutton our collars. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I went to Kairos West as well. And if you guys don't know what that is, it's a free food market that we set up. And so these three men came in a van and they told us that they had 12 or so other people living with them. Um, and they were going and collecting the food. And this one man said that he didn't want to take too much because he wanted other people to have some. And I just, I really liked that. Valerie, and then we're going to close with prayer. I had a really different experience. I spent two hours with one person. And this was a person who started by being a little angry because they felt the church had abandoned them because no one had been to see them and they felt disconnected. But they were anxious for news and they were anxious to find out what was going on and they wanted to know about specific people and what was happening with them. And we had a great conversation, but as I was walking out the door, and we gave each other a hug and I walked out the door, she looked at me and she said, please don't forget I'm here. Mm. Please don't forget I'm here. Mm. And I said, we're going to try to do better. Mm. We're going to try to do better. So it was, it was a powerful message. And the thing that was interesting about it is knowing this person and knowing their background, I could look at that person and say, that's me in 20 or 30 years. Mm. So it was very powerful. Thank you. Uh, I, I think what, what John in this first John is trying to get at is what we've experienced today. Um, more than anything else, John wants us to get that God is not an idea. God is not a philosophy. Um, God is embodied love. That's what it is. God is embodied love. And the way that God invites us to follow Him is by embodying love, which is what we try to do. Would you pray together? God, we give you great thanks for the many stories that we have this evening, for the ways that we have worshipped you today by serving, by showing up, by being present. You were in the midst of each of those. Thank you for sending us out as as your beloved children, and welcoming us back in with joy. 
For all the places that we served, God, we pray that you will continue to be present there. Remain and abide with them in ways that we cannot. Reconnect us in ways that we do not expect. And continue to move in and through us to embody your love for our community. Through Christ we pray. Amen.